Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. Recently on the west side of Manhattan, where I live, we had a two-year debate about rezoning elementary schools. The goal was to alleviate overcrowding, but it also revealed that even in this liberal neighborhood, integrating segregated schools still presents many challenges. I was really surprised and asked Dr. Amy Stewart-Wells, professor of sociology and education at Teachers College, whose research focuses on issues of race and education, to join me today. Welcome. Thank you. I remember in my neighborhood, 40 years ago or more, when these schools were first built, mm -hmm. 191 and 199, mm -hmm. that we paired them. Mm -hmm. It was one of the early experiments, right? Right, right? And I think it lasted for about six years, but then it changed because yes. people weren't happy and these things did it. And then when you think that Brown versus the Board of Ed, uh, what was 62, 63 years ago, and we're still talking about the difference in quality of education. Right. So you've come along <laughs> and you devoted your, a lot of your life to talk, investigating and talking about this. That's right. So tell me, what is it? Where do we stand? Are we ever going to have an integrated school system that's going to give all children the same kind of education? Well, I think we can make many more strides in that direction than we have been in New York City in particular. Um, because I think what's happened is we've allowed these structures of inequality and segregation to exist. And so these sharp distinctions between 199 and 191 exist, and it's hard for people to get past that. Because now these schools represent different things to people in, in their minds. And so... And then we rely on individuals to kind of transcend those boundaries um, that have become so stark. And what we need is really more support, more incentives, and kind of a more proactive leadership around these issues and how do we do that. So we actually know from the research that if we try to think of ways in which we could incentivize parents to, to make the choices, if we could work within schools to try to help parents understand the educational benefits of diversity when they're crossing these racial boundaries, um, that that's one way to do it and to um, really work on the curriculum and the teaching within these schools to foster these educational benefits. We know from the research how to do that. There have been a lot of studies, haven't there, about yes. the uh, importance and the benefits of yes. integrated education. Yes, so we need to reframe schools, right? We need to reframe education. We've been um, working in a system where we're only defining schools by narrow test scores. Um, and this is a problem. It's led to more stratification and more segregation Definitely. in the system. I mean, a parent looks at the schools, at the ratings, and it right. sees what that is, and that's the end of it, right? Right. And so that's how we're judging schools. But when you actually talk to parents of all different racial, ethnic backgrounds, that's on a day-to-day -day basis, that's not even what they care the most about. They actually care a lot about how their, particularly the younger grades, how their children are treated in the school, how they interact with the teachers, the kind of community and care that you find in the school. And so, yes, they care that their kids are learning and want, they want them to be able to read, they want them to be able to do math. But um, at the end of the day, it's really how they're treated as a, as a child within a school. So the social emotional components of development as well as the cognitive. Most parents know that those go hand in hand. And so focusing more holistically on students and schools and then allowing us to really tap into some of these benefits that children gain from being with students from different backgrounds, how they learn from students from different backgrounds. I think that's really what I'm hearing a lot of parents say that they want in a school system. The problem is the system hasn't moved in that direction enough to create those places where parents are willing to make choices that go against the grain. So the no child left behind, what does that do to this whole thing? Well, that just, I mean, it kind of built on a system that was already starting to be um, created through earlier legislation that goes back to the Clinton administration and even back to the first Bush administration um, when he worked with the governors and created standards and um, implemented and then through the Clinton administration when we created Goals 2000 and we asked the states to build these accountability systems and then No Child Left Behind was passed and early 2000 and that basically made it mandatory for the states to participate in this and created sanctions related to that. So what did it mean? I never quite understood what it, what it called for. Is that what set the, the, the practice of testing? That's what, re, I mean, it, some testing existed before that, but mm -hmm. that's what made it more mandatory mm -hmm. and it made it more punitive. So 
not having high test scores, there were sanctions and, and consequences for that. And it, and it also directed or had an influence on the curriculum then? Oh, absolutely, yeah. particularly for schools with lower test scores. Yeah. And what we actually know from the research is that students' test scores are very much correlated with their mother's education, with their parents' socioeconomic status. And so what happens is the schools that have high concentrations of low-income students um, are, are working you know, to, to try to raise the test scores, but at the same time, they're often being penalized for having low test scores. So we need to really think about um, how that works against integration. When you're defining all the schools that have lower income students as failing, despite what they may be doing in the school that may be very strong in terms of curriculum mm -hmm. and pedagogy, and I know some schools like that in New York City, um, that are, the test scores are going up and they're working very hard, but they're also doing amazing things with students in their curriculum, but they're being defined as a, as a failing school or as not as good as this other school. And as their I population was. is is more, it's not as mixed and diverse. Right, because so. even if parents are, into, even if parents say higher SES, socioeconomic status parents and white parents are interested in the school, interested in some of the programs going on at these schools, they're often turned away because of these test scores. They, they decide not to make that choice because the test scores are lower than another school. And I think, um, well, I'm not saying we shouldn't test students and we shouldn't pay attention to math and reading achievement to solely base our, our, how we evaluate a school based on those test scores I think is really wrong and problematic. In this. And really, honestly, when you talk to parents about what they want in schools for their children, it doesn't even match that. So I really think we need to broaden these definitions of good and bad schools to broaden the kinds of measures we're using and that maybe preparing children for the 21st century, preparing children to get along with students from other backgrounds, to have some intercultural understanding and intelligence because that's the reality of the world that we live in, that, that, we, that schools should be held accountable for some of that work as well. So how do we do it? <laughs> Well, I think um, through certain boundary changes we can do it, but I think also working more intensely with the school. We run a project at Teachers College called The Public Good, and it's a public school support organization, or a PSSO, where we work with school leadership and teachers um, in the schools to really think through curricular changes related to school diversity and integration. We work with parents on how to work together. Um, instead of having certain parents with more power and privilege kind of taking over the PTA, but really how do we create a community at a school that is diverse? So how do you do that? I mean, what do you do? You work with the school on creating the curriculum? How do you work with the parents to get the diversity in the school? Well, we actually try to bring parents, we're in the first phase of this work now, we'll be working on this this spring. So we've done some in-depth interviews with parents and, and educators from different backgrounds and perspectives, mm -hmm. and then try to find some common ground, because after all, public schools are, are supposed to be our common schools, so they're supposed to be schools that bring people together from different walks of life. But when you do that, you have to start to find common ground in terms of understandings about what the school is for, how it serves our children, so that's what, so we're engaging parents around the themes that have emerged that we see some commonality even though there may be racial division. So how can we talk about that? How can we create a truly public school? So for all where time? are you doing this? It's in certain sites. Right now we're working in Brooklyn, um, and the schools are not yet identified because of confidentiality reasons. How do you reach people to tell them what's happening in their school? You reach out to parents who are either considering the school, parents so, who are currently in so the school. So you start with young, do you start with, pre -K, with a K, kindergarten? Yes, depending on the school, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also work, interview staff, the teachers, the, mm -hmm. the leadership of the school to understand what they're hoping to accomplish as schools become more diverse in certain pockets of the city. Are but, magnet schools good examples of what happens? Do magnet schools have more diversity? What is a magnet school? <laughs> well, going back in history, magnet schools, um, which were supported by court cases and the federal government in the 1970s initially, and then um, were actually funded through the federal government since then, although their funding has declined, um, were created to, to kind of augment voluntary desegregation. So in the context of what people called force busing or student reassignment, magnet schools were created to, to create a choice program within the public school system. Um, so they usually had themes. Um, for, for the high school level, they would have themes like science or math or performing arts. Um, in K through 12, they might have, the, you could have a Montessori magnet school, you could have all sorts of different 
kinds of focus. Um, some of them are also science or math for the elementary. So the idea was that you'd bring, you'd, then you'd allow choice within a school district and then you'd have, at the beginning they had racial quotas really, to say we create, we create these schools that are magnets for parents to choose, but we also create a racial balancing system in the application and admissions process. So the, unlike charter schools where the admissions happen at the school level, and with magnet schools they were done at the district level, so that the district could assure there was racial balance. Is and this is your uh, is this new attempt or new effort to bring more diversity? It's in a way following the higher education people who wanted to bring more diversity yes. to their schools? Yes. So and it's a whole interesting political relationship, yes. isn't it? It's very different. So, um, but it could be more similar, and we're, we're trying yeah. to work on that. So the report that we released with the Century Foundation mm -hmm. pointed out the dissimilarity between higher education and our efforts to create, to maintain affirmative mm -hmm. action in higher education. And the way in which the universities have framed this, including my university, Columbia, is the value of diverse classrooms with yeah. students from different backgrounds. This is in response to their not being able to have racial quotas? Yes. And what the Supreme Court has held on to is that there are benefits, and educational benefits, and First Amendment rights of universities to maintain For diversity. To maintain diversity. Now they're, but they're, if you come up and say, you're going to take such a percentage of this and that, they say no. Right. So the means by which you get there have changed, but the, but the basic goal has, main, has been maintained legally. So that's very yes. important then for grade schools. Yes. Well, the problem is we haven't applied that to <laughs> so much with the K-12 through system. So we did yeah. have um, one Supreme Court case in 2007 that was still based on the, the whole legal history of the K-12 through cases around mm -hmm. desegregation. Have been have used a very different focus mm -hmm. around Fourteenth Amendment rights and histories of discrimination, which are which is important that history. However, the K through twelve cases have not done as good a job as framing the educational benefits of diversity. So that's something we are working on at Teachers College. We're working with a group of um, lawyers and leaders that we're going to meet be meeting at Harvard in the fall to talk about legal strategies. Well, that's for very K interesting. Yes, well, that's a, that's very exciting. It's I very think that's exciting. terrific. Yes, yeah, but because. Once we had Brown versus the Board of Education, I mean, then we started busing. Did that happen right away or did that come later? Remember? Uh, yes, there really wasn't much quote unquote busing in the U.S. until the late 1960s. Yeah. So there was a lot of stalling and right. um, efforts. And a lot of controversy. A lot of controversy. Um, and then even after there was quote unquote busing, there were also a lot of voluntary means for achieving desegregation. So we often think of desegregation as the same thing as, as forced busing, mm -hmm. but, there, but through these magnet programs that we've talked about, there were also a lot of choice programs in place that allowed students to choose schools on the other side of, of town. And so there was a lot of choice woven into many of the desegregation plans. It wasn't all forced student reassignment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of ironic that in the 1990s, 2000s... That we switched totally, right? Yes, that, that there's been a, a large push for school choice as if there hadn't been any. But actually in the 70s and 80s, there had been quite a lot of school choice under the framework of, of integration. The more recent school choice policies of charter schools and open enrollment are under the framework of a market and competition and um, letting you know, consumers choose schools without really thinking about the greater good and these issues of racial imbalance. So unfortunately, the choice policies that have been popular in the last 20 years have led to more segregation. Because they lead to vouchers? to charter Charters, schools, right. to all these different kinds of things, right? Right, because they, they lack the guidelines that the desegregation plans had and the goals of achieving integration. They're mostly just free market, so they're very deregulated choice plans that, um, that just kind of let people go where they will. And when you do that, um, it often leads to more segregation. So that's what I'm saying. We need strong public policies to support integration. You did a study with a colleague of Nassau County? Yes, several colleagues. Several <laughs> colleagues, because yes. it was a massive program. It was a massive project, project yeah. yes. Tell us about it. <laughs> well, um, it's funny because I was just out on Long Island this weekend. People were talking about it again. But um, <laughs> yes, so as, we, as many of us probably know, Nassau County is one of the most fragmented um, counties in America. And so it's divided into so many small municipalities and school districts, 56 school districts oh. serving 220,000 students in the county. Um, so they're divided into these very, very small 
through by these very small boundary lines. So that's so interesting. Yes. So the segregation happens across the boundaries, and then the districts change quickly as soon as you start to see racial change. So we also know there were federal policies in the 90s and 2000s that pushed for greater home ownership among black and Latino lower income families, which then started to move people out to the suburbs. Um, and so then that that racial change didn't happen evenly over different school districts and communities in places like Nassau County. There was the same kind of racial steering that happened back in the um, in the 50s and 60s and the 70s in the cities was happening in the suburbs. And, um, and so you see pockets of racial segregation. The school district boundary lines become it's, symbolic of race. It's so interesting. It's like the it's like redistricting of a congressional district. Yes. Like North Carolina, they just threw out one because it concentrated everybody into people of color into one district and yes. left white. So it follows the same. I mean, it's the same. Yes, thing. except with the school districts in Nassau, the the boundary lines are there. Yeah. It's just then that the choices that are made and the way in which people get pushed in one direction or another through the real estate agents, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm have created the segregation. That was an argument also, you know, in, on the West Side. Mm -hmm. People said, well, we bought an apartment here because right. we thought we were going there. So the answer is what? Changing the zoning? In, on the, on the on Long Island? Well, I think many, <laughs> many people have argued that there should be consolidation of school districts on Long Island, mm -hmm. for whether you're arguing for fiscal reasons, um, because it just doesn't really make sense economically. Um, or you're arguing for educational reasons, right? Because you you allow more students to have more access to more resources as well as more integration. So, if but they, you have to have a political will to do this. Yes, you do. And that does that become a problem? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been to many uh, events on Long Island where I've been asked to speak about this research, and I think people pretty well understand the problem. The question goes back to the political will to do something about it. And who would rezone the, the, the uh, school districts? Well, it would have to be through state law, but there would have to be some coalition, I would think, at the grassroots level to do this. The interest in, uh, are there a lot of, there are no charter schools out there, are there? Not that I know of, no, not yet. There are some magnet schools that were started by the BOCES, um, the Bureau of Cooperative mm -hmm. um, Services. So there are a few inter-district magnet schools that exist that have been very popular. So they just give an, they're an example of how you can cross these boundary lines. So who in the, in the state, in the legislature, how does it work? Is it upstate, downstate? I mean, we have, New York City also has a whole different way of doing it, doesn't it? In, in terms of schools? Yeah. And funding? Yeah. Yes. With the property taxes and the... Yes. That's why, I mean, the fact that we have the 32 community school districts in New York City for the kindergarten through eighth grade um, creates kind of this district-wide, this separate district effects. But it's still one system, so those boundaries could be changed within the districts or between them. And can the, could the city change those boundaries? For the, for the 32 community school districts, my understanding is the state would need to be involved. But would. to change the attendance boundaries within those districts to create more integration, mm -hmm. like in District 3, mm -hmm. with 191 and 199, that could be done at the local level. The, de the, the Department of Education supported the yes. change, and, yes. and they are generally supportive of this effort. It would be interesting to our viewers to know that New York City is one of the most segregated yes. educational systems in the country. Yes. Amazing, right? Right, right. This, well, you have this progressive image. Everybody says, oh, you're so liberal, you're from New York City. But we're not. And we have a very diverse population. Um, there's a lot more that we could be doing in New York City, absolutely, Yeah. around changing boundary lines within existing districts and in New York. I was fascinated by your description that um, how the migration goes out to the, you know, now it's changing, isn't it? Because the suburbs are coming yes. back. Yes. So yes. it's an opportunity, really. It's a huge opportunity. Not only are people coming back, so white, middle, upper middle class, um, mostly college graduates, right, are moving back into the city that their grandparents fled, you know, several decades ago. Um, during the black migration and the creation of the suburbs and the subsidies for white homeowners to move to the suburbs. So in our interviews with a lot of these white gentrifying parents, um, they, they, part of the reason they came back is they found the suburbs boring. They also found them too homogeneous. They wanted to raise their children in more cosmopolitan, metropolitan contexts. Um, and that includes the schools they're looking for. So 
we have such an opportunity right now to create these racially diverse schools, but to also do it in a way that stabilizes these communities as opposed to having this kind of change come in, this movement of gentrifiers um, coming in the schools flip from being almost all black and Latino to almost all white. And so we need to find a way to stabilize those schools. That's the project that we're working on. And part of that is, um, is, is really learning what, what it means to be an integrated school from mm -hmm. different standpoints and perspectives. Mm -hmm. And what it means to be in a school where parents have access to different resources and economic status. And how do you create a school that's really for all children in that context and where they're learning from each other? That's very hard work. It's something we didn't learn very well the first time we did desegregation in this country, but it's something we know a lot about now and that we're working on. So has the, has the recent um, creation of these small special schools hurt it also, or has it, do they have more diversified? Oh, at the high school level? Yeah, or even aren't some of the middle schools and, yeah. you know, what yeah. happens when that happens? The small schools. They, they are also an opportunity to create more integration because they're choice-based. So we've moved away from the zoned high schools and, and as many zoned middle schools. So when you move in that direction, you're creating opportunities. Um, the problem is, I think, is the admissions process for the high schools in New York City, which tends to lead to more stratification and segregation. Um, so we're basically stratifying all our students based on very narrow measures of achievement. How do we? As, how do they? Assign? I, I, if I was a parent now, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I would be able to face the challenge it is to decide where I want to have right. my child go. Right, because so there's confusing. so many different tiers. Yeah. That's right. And um, the highest tiers, the most sought after schools, are based either on the exams, the, the specialized high schools. And they've always been there, though. Yes, or I the mean, screens. Many years ago, I went to the high school of music and art, and that was a diversified, that had a mm -hmm. diversified student body. There was no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But that's because we had musicians and artists that came from different backgrounds. Right, right. I mean, if we look at Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, yeah, yeah. Um, it's mostly white and Asian in a city that's not. That's so, true. yeah. Yes. So, um, using those measures are going to lead to those results. And if then the next tier would be the screened high schools, which are a mixture of your middle school test scores and grades, depending on the specific school. Um, so, We've kind of created these many layers based on At the on bottom, you have zone schools? Yes. So. And do the zone schools tend to have the people who haven't been able to get into or didn't apply to other schools? There aren't that many zone schools left, and I think it depends. There's some pockets in places like Queens where I think the zone schools are, are higher achieving than other places, yeah. but yes. And more diversified? Um, not really. Not really. No. Would the object be to make... Um, to encourage more zone schools in more diversified districts? I think we have to step back and say whether they're zoned or smaller schools. Um, we have to just look at the process by which students end up in these schools. And, um, and if we want to create a choice system, we could certainly do that in a more equitable way. If we want, if we want to have a choice system that doesn't just kind of measure kids by these very narrow measures of achievement, and ability and then kind of rank them all and, and sort them into different schools, some of which are very competitive and not very nurturing schools and, um, and some that are you know very inadequate in terms of their curriculum and their college prep. So we created a system that um, ranks students at a very early age and then cuts off a lot of opportunities and creates a lot of stress and anxiety for students at the top. I hear more and more about that. So. Um, mm -hmm. It's not really serving anyone very well, and I think we need to step back and... and the pressure yes. on kids now is so much more, I think, than it used to be, because yes. everything depends. Where are you going to go to pre-K? Where are you going to go to school? This, right, right. high school, college, right. graduate school, what are you going to do? Right. It's the whole thing. And the high school choice process in New York City really... It's very hard. Yes. Right? Very I think that the Board of Education really needs to go into every district and explain, or you, or advocates, right. and explain and advise and really build the support. I just, I don't, it's a massive program, right, and problem. It's massive, but, but there and are so several districts. so basic to this yes. world. Yes. We live in such a, I mean, it, the city is now 51, more than 50% people of color. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing if we have 
just isolated schools that are 85% white. It's crazy, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and there are several community school districts in New York that are working really hard on these issues. District 1 in Manhattan, mm -hmm. um, District 13 in Brooklyn, District 14 in Brooklyn. So um, I think that it is coming from the local. And yeah. there's a lot of student advocates now um, right. that we have across the city who are working That's on these issues. So I think there's a lot of grassroots energy, mm -hmm. and hopefully that will um, be heard and recognized at the city level. So I, I think there, there are signs that that is happening, but I think much more needs to be done. And there needs to be more openness about what's happening yeah. in the DOE around these issues. Right. And you're, so you're, you should be optimistic because it's the beginning of a, another yes. change, right? Yes. I mean, I think um, the more we talk about it on television, mm -hmm. we're also doing a summer institute at Teachers College on teaching and learning in racially diverse mm -hmm. schools in July. Um, and so we, we've seen a lot of demand for that. Educators coming forward and saying, how do we do progressive education and culturally relevant education, and how do we bring those together? So that's exactly what we're working on, the hard work of teaching and learning, you know, and mm -hmm. how do we try to kind of broaden our understandings of intelligence and ability to make diversity stronger and better within our public schools. Well, I certainly hope that you're very successful and that people really help and understand the, the importance of this. So Thank we've you. come to the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much Thank you for very coming. Much. Yes. Thank you. We at CUNY TV always like to hear from our viewers. So if you have any subjects you'd like to explore or people you'd like to hear, please let us know. Write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or go to our website, cuny.tv, and click on Contact Us. We look forward to hearing from you.